what, what an incredible joy for me to be here today to talk with Alan Moyer. Um, if you haven't seen his exposition yet, since it just opened today, uh, it's, it's absolutely breathtaking. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot wait for people to, to see this work, and it's, um, it's an honor for me to, to speak with you today. Um, this is, this, normally, this is our Wachovia Theater. For those people who haven't been in our space yet, this is the famous Wachovia Theater. Uh, and if you are interested in more events um, in our season, whether that's theater or art or fashion or music, um, there are more of these arts event calendars uh, out in the lobby. Uh, we do an awful lot in, for, a, for a small liberal arts college. Uh, it, we're very proud of our our arts here at Albright. Um, I just want to start by saying two things. One is that the, the, the questions that I have, I, um, I was offered tons and tons of questions from our students. Uh, we went to our theater students and said, what do you want to know? And so I've, so, so I've uh, put them into 10 simple categories and we'll make our way through those categories and then hopefully have some time for Q&A in, in case there are some specific things that we haven't been able to cover in these topics that, uh, that you want to know about. Um, but I'll just say, because I never remember from year to year whether or not I've, uh, whether I've had a chance to say this or not, I would not be, I would not have come to Albright College if it hadn't been for Alan Moyer. Um, because when I was trying to decide between schools where I was going to major in biochemistry, like Alan was going to, or began here as well, um, the Albright Reporter, the magazine that we put out, came to my parents' house because my brother was here studying philosophy and religion. Uh, and the set design for She Stoops to Conquer was on the cover of this magazine. And I was trying desperately not to fulfill my sort of creative dreams. I was going to leave all that aside and, and, um, and, and move forward into the future and, and medicine. Uh, and I saw this set design and I thought, well, at least I will see beautiful, beautiful theater, stunning design. Um, and uh, so I just want to say thank you for that design. I don't, think I, heard that, I don't think I'd heard that story before. So that's what made me decide to come to Albright College. In my first year, I did not participate in the domino right. players at all. I can tell you exactly the three seats that I sat in to see The Crucible, and Every Good Boy Deserves Favor, and Helen. Um, and just all three times, absolutely blown away by the visual splendor of the designs. And I just, it changed the course of my life um, to be around this art. And then to finally get to meet and work with Alan. And you know, within short order, we were, we were working together, collaborating. And, you know, Alan's always been so generous. We offer, you know, inspiration, but certainly guidance and, um, and process. I mean, that's the thing to be to be 17, 18 years old, and to and to watch the detail, the precision, the the consistency of of making sure that all audiences are being served when they come to see a, you know a, a work of theater. And, um, it's it's a, it, it's been a joy of my life. That then oddly enough. I don't know, 15 years later, whenever it was, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had the chance to work together professionally twice. Um, one, of, one of the designs is in the exhibition Mother of Us All at Glimmer Glass Opera and San Francisco Opera, and then again- In at, New York City? Uh, New York City Opera, right? And then at Opera Pacific, we did your production of The Abduction from the Seraglio, set on the Orient Express. It was incredible, incredible. <laughs> um, so you've been an incredible touchstone to my creative life. I thank you so much for that. That's very uh, sweet. And for, your, and for your faith in me as a student, uh, you saw me eye to eye. You set a standard for me as a professor, and I always vow every day to yeah. live up to that standard of making sure that we all feel like collaborators. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. So biochemistry, Albright College, <laughs> and then what happened? Um, well, Lynn Morrow happened, and uh, <laughs> I, I got involved in doing plays, and um, I also, you know, it, was, um, it, it wasn't just that, it was, you know, I, I came here and uh, I was so well prepared. My, my high, I went to, I grew up in Schuylkill Haven, and um, my high school was so advanced in, as far as biology, so by the time I got here, it was interesting, because the biology, for, 
the first year of biology, I was sort of bored because it was so, I was so far beyond it. But then on the other hand, chemistry, I, I swear, after the second class, I didn't know what was going on. And I worked so hard to get through it, and I, I did okay, but I thought to myself, listen, next year's organic chemistry. This ain't gonna happen. <laughs> and I just wasn't really enjoying myself. But what I was interested in was, I was uh, actually was mostly interested in, at that point, was I was taking German literature classes with um, uh, Luther Brossmann, Herr, Herr Brossmann. And um, I was lucky enough to do well in achievement tests and ended up in literature classes. It was me and like four German majors that were seniors. <laughs> and I, I, it was hard to keep up, but um, um, mostly because Brossmann, um, um, you know, he was like, you know, this guy doesn't have to be here. And he's working really hard. <laughs> and he, he really made it enjoyable for me. Um, I'm not sure the other people in the class liked me because I felt like I was maybe a, a teacher's pet. But, so I was reading German plays mostly, um, and because um, we did there was a 20th century drama, German drama class, and I really loved reading plays. And um, so then I decided I wanted to maybe do something else. So I started taking dramatic, dramatic literature classes, and and then I'm like, do I want to be a set designer or a director? And Lynn gave me opportunities to design scenery for the first time. And I realized that I did want to focus on that, and I couldn't do that here. Mm -hmm. And so that I transferred to Penn State. After two years? Two years here. Mm -hmm. But then, Lynn, because she, you know, she's never wanted to let go of somebody that's useful. <laughs> um, and I say that with a lot of love. <laughs> but uh, it, so she, she said, just because you're at Penn State, you know, two hours away, doesn't mean you can't still design shows for me. <laughs> so and she and some, build, you know and paint them and, and come while well, it happened there. or whatever yeah. and she would and she said listen I'll find uh, somehow I'll find a couple hundred dollars too to help that will pay for your back and forth and whatever so I ended up doing that and um, for th my two years at Penn State and then because I was also involved in the summer theater here which you were yeah. <laughs> uh, that then I I decided to move here, and so I was here for three years between undergraduate and graduate school. That's when we got to work together. That's, that's right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so, um, so maybe that's, the, the rest is, you know, as they say, history. Because uh, then I went to NYU for uh, MFA in design, and uh, then just, it was off and running, you know. Um, so, is there, was there a, a day, because the, the, the questions that are in this first category are sort of, you know, talking to Alan about identity. How do you identify as a designer? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, especially in an, in an institution like this on the undergraduate level, where now that there's a degree program, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't, I mean, even though students say, I, uh, I think I'm an actor, I think I'm a director, I think I'm a designer, you know, they have to do it all. Right. They have right. to do all of it, and, and, that, and as they should, right? You know, um, but was there, was there a day that you just sort of said that, yeah, I'm, I'm a designer. That's, um, that's what I, that's. I don't think so. Because I, I also think that, um, uh, I, I think it's now that, you know, looking back at things, I think that when you're, when you're 20 years old or 18 years old, you expect there to be that day. Yeah. And I find that that day, I think with many things in life, that it's, um, it's wrong to be looking for those days. Because I, uh, now, speaking, I'm really speaking for myself, of course, but some people would say, oh, there was this, this amazing moment where a light bulb went off in my head. Uh, and, and it certainly it does happen, but I think if it doesn't happen, you shouldn't feel like you're missing part of a process or something. I, I, I believe it's a very gradual thing, um, and I, um, I, at a certain point, you have to make some decisions, and, and I don't really know. I, I think that eventually I realize, well, for me, I, I, over the time I realized, listen, I don't want to be a director because I don't want to have to sit in a rehearsal room, sit, I don't want to be in a rehearsal room six hours a day. That does not interest me. Um, that's not part of the part that interests me about the part, the part that interests me about directing is the part of conceiving a production, yeah. and that's something that you do in your designer as well. Yeah. And so I get to do that, and then I'm involved with it in a way. But I also don't have to be. I'd rather be in a scene shop communicating with people or a costume shop dealing with people uh, than in a rehearsal room or talking to directors and producers and. You know, conceptualizing. Yeah, it's all about. For me, the you know, honestly, it's it's a, in the process of design of, of doing a show. Um, 
the exciting part is the conceptualizing. And to a certain extent, the rest is sort of drudge work. I mean, once you have the idea, like that's the excitement. Um, and then the rest stays, can be exciting still because it's exciting to work towards that idea. But the rest is kind of nuts and bolts at that point. You know, the, hard, the hard part and the exciting part is reading the play, listening to the opera, whatever you're working on. Um, that's the exciting part. And then figuring out what part of that, like how we as a collective group feel about it. Because that's the other part of, about the theater that to me is exciting. It's the working with other people. It's, like, it's a kind of community, just like it's a communal experience when you're sitting in the audience. And uh, it's one of the things that's so beautiful about the theater that's like, that nothing can replace the live experience. I'm sorry, but watching something on TV or in a movie theater or and on your computer, it's just not the same. There's something about being in a room and for that moment experiencing with 100, 2,000 people, whatever, the exact same event that, that night. It's, a, it's almost like, you know, when I was a kid, we, we'd all get together. Like, somehow it seemed every week we watched the Carol Burnett show together as a family, you know. And, and, I, and I find that a lot of times when you talk to young people now, even that experience, that communal experience of sitting in a room with the rest of your family watching a single show is unusual. First of all, it's unusual for a lot of people, a family, to all be sitting in the same room. And second of all, to be all watching one thing and reacting to it. And I think that... Because there was one television. There's one television. <laughs> and now everyone's on their own devices, often in another space. So you don't get to share that. And I think that that is, I think, an important part about being an empathetic person. That you, it helps you as an, it's it, by nature, it's like the very nature, it's an empathetic experience because you're all experiencing the same thing. And so it helps you be an empathetic person, which I think um, is you know, part of being a human being. You know, so, but anyway, it's the collaboration that really interests me. Yeah. Um, I think if I was an, um, an easel painter, it, I, I, it, would be, it would be very difficult for me at a certain point, you know, I end up, you know, in my studio and we're working and, you know, these, like you'll see these models downstairs, the scale models of things, and they take hours and hours and hours. So you're there, but usually with, you're with assistants and stuff too. But, um, uh, but you know that you're all going to come back together. You all go and you, to a certain extent, do your separate work based on a sort of single idea or direction uh, that you've all come up with together then you know you're all going to end up in the same room again, and that's in the theater, and that's when you're really going to make it happen. So this is going to combine mm -hmm. two, the, the, the two next things, which are sort of script analysis, and you know, where, where do you and your collaborators start? What do you look for in, in a script or a score? Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I guess the, the, the gist of the questions really had to do with um, I hope the hidden question was, how important is script analysis? But I, um, well, so I'm gonna assume that it is, because we know from working with Lynn, I mean, that was the thing that, I mean, it was you know, pounded, pounded into our heads over mm -hmm. you. Have to know how to read a script. You have to know how to pull apart. You have to know what's inside it. And then it's up to you and the, and the other designers and the director and then the performers, right, to, um, to somehow flesh this script out into a, into a production. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you, our students want to know how you read a script, what are you looking for in a script, mm -hmm. and then how is the script the touchstone with you and your collaborators mm -hmm. to come up with a, a, a design? Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. I, don't, I think that, uh, you know, as a theater artist, you're an interpretive artist. And so, you know, it's different. I mean, somehow it ends up being um, a slightly negative connotation to, to, to compare the, the, the idea of if you're an easel painter or if you're a poet or whatever, Technically, that's called you're, that you're a creative artist. And when you work at, in theater, you're an interpretive artist. And so you, one shouldn't think that one is better than the other necessarily. Uh, but somehow creative, interpretive, somehow creative sense. It's not like you're not creative as an interpretive person, too. But, um, or vice versa, I suppose. Yeah. But um, so you have to start somewhere. And to me, the script is sacrosanct. Um, and I think that that's the one thing that I, I'm always very skeptical when people uh, 
remarkably change a text. I think there has to be very good, you have to really earn that, I think. Uh, so yeah, it's all about script analysis. And I think it's hard because especially for designers, it's not, it's not enough of a designer's training about reading plays. And um, I was shocked when I, you know, I thought I was screwing up all along. You know, started out in biochemistry, then I end up basically, you know, an English major reading a lot of plays and whatever. You know, it's like, shouldn't I have been you know, studying stagecraft or art or something, you know, right? Well, I, I actually think that the path, the crazy path I took would be a path that um, would benefit more people. Because I, I, sometimes I think to myself, well, I wonder, like, how... What is it that helped me? What makes me different? You know, and um, one time, I think it was the playwright Kenneth Lonergan said to me, "I've never met or imagined a designer who could read a play like you do," and that meant a lot to me. Um, and I've had a lot of I have I've had a lot of really strong relationships with playwrights, which is. Probably in the end, and composers, yeah. probably in the end, the thing I'm proudest of in my career. Um, because I have, I don't know how you'd write a play, honestly. I mean, I, I just have a, a, or a musical, my God, musicals are the most complicated thing in the world. I mean, you know, so many times people say, oh, you do opera, so that must be the hardest thing in the world. So musical, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. That, you know, there is no such thing as a small musical. <laughs> there are small operas. Um, but, um, but anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm getting away from the no, topic. No. But um, I, I do think that it's all about script analysis. And I don't think people can uh, uh, overemphasize how important that is. Um, you have to understand that all plays are different. They're not all created equal. Um, they all have their distinct personality. So they ought to des they deserve your specific attention to their uniqueness. Some are bad, which is why they're unique, but still you're forced. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes, it's, I have to say, oftentimes the work I'll do on something that I don't think is all that good as far as material, it's almost like you can know you have to overcompensate for it in a weird way. Um, you work sometimes a lot harder on something that you think is just not as good. And then sometimes you're just wrong. You know, once you spend time and you're inside that piece for a while, yeah. you, uh, you realize that, no, oh, there is more here than meets yeah. the eye, uh, you know. Yeah. And maybe it's that it's not a, a kind of, you know, well-made play or whatever, yeah. and there's something peculiar about it that could be better, but it's still, it's got something to say. Well, I just, I remember, you know, this is our only space to, to work in, so we rehearse and we produce mm -hmm. in, in here. And for young for myself as a young director and you know, my students who who aspire to directing as well, uh, let alone the actors, uh, to, to be in this empty space working, mm -hmm. but we're in the theater. We can imagine mm -hmm. the final product, yeah, you know, yeah. day to day, as opposed to being in a room that has tape on the floor mm -hmm. and you know whatever. Right. You know, is is a is a luxury mm -hmm. to and and um, and also for me has been a, a a great lesson in sort of simplicity. Like I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. really, I don't really need much. Mm -hmm. it, you know, if the play is good, mm -hmm. you know, that the actors will tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so I can imagine why it might seem like uh, add a lot of stuff to take away from the fact that there's, there's not much, right, there's not right, much there. Right, there right, you know? right. And so, it's not even necessarily about adding a lot of stuff. It's a matter of like your focus on it to solve the yeah. problems. Because yeah. a lot of times you, you know, you're in a way what you're doing is problem solving. So the two, so the two areas are you know, with the with the people in the room, right? Um, there's all the, the conceptualization, and then, you know, for for me, I also I also want to know about at what point do you say, well, I've I've got to know what the space is capable of mm -hmm. before I can even begin to think about uh, about the design. I have to know do do I have access to to traps and turntables right, right, right. and fly? You know, mm -hmm. like how much how much of all of this is sort of Put into yeah, the hopper yeah. before anything's even put. Well, together. generally, you know, so much of the of the work you do is just 
these sort of general impressions you have. So you have a, you, you almost always know where you're going to be doing something, at least for this, its first incarnation. Things tour, they change spaces, whatever. But um, uh, I think that what's, what I, is, I, what I think a, a nice clean process is, is a lot of meetings about the play. Um, sometimes it comes very quickly. Um, other times it's, it's very, very slow. But my goal is always to get to a certain point with the director and my other, my other collaborators to a point where I feel like that you all kind of know what the play is about. And, and, um, uh, and then, or what you all think as a group what the play is about. Mm -hmm. Like this is what we want to say with this play. Because usually plays, um, what was it? Was it, was it Peter Brooks that said, I think, that if you, if, if you um, let the play speak for itself, there's a good chance it won't, I'm paraphrasing, there's a good chance it won't say anything. <laughs> and that you have to, and, and Peter Brook to me, in, in my generation, uh, and, it, and we're sort of riffing on it with the name of this show downstairs um, in the gallery, is that for me, the Peter Brook's book, The Empty Space, was, I mean, it, it is, it really is one of the most uh, central um, books ever written about the theater and making theater. And I think it still holds up really well on its own uh, now, too. But, um, so it's really about, I always figured, like, if we're all together and we've decided what the, what the play's gonna say, it then means that we can all go our, because at a certain point then you all go your separate ways. Costume designers doing sketches, finding swatches, set designers doing the whole, starting on rough models or sketches, or whatever. Everyone's, everyone has their way. The director is then getting ready to, sometimes they're finishing casting even, which is useful, and then they have to get in the room. You know, we're not all in the room all at the same time all the time. So if you have a good solid, like, okay, this is our brief, this is what we're doing, um, that's, you're gonna have a good show if you do that. Whether it's a great show or an inspired show, that's where the bit of magic happens, and that's when you just put everybody together, it's like a, a, there's a chemical reaction, and it either is exciting or it's whatever, or yeah. whatever. But as it, you know that at least you're being responsible if you've done that sort of, you've built the foundation. Now maybe you can build a really beautiful house on top of it. But um, so, so I think that's a really essential part of the process. And yes, you have to think about the space, but then that, that starts, it's like space and scale and budget are things that are always in the back of your mind. Um, and then once you make those decisions, that's when you think about it. because. Yeah, the this, this space affects what you're going to be able to do, and you're thinking about it. But as long as you have that idea, you can figure, you can figure it out. Without that idea about what kind of show you're doing, you're, you're lost. Yeah. You know? Um, you really are. And are there, are there um, at what point in those conversations about what, what do we want to, you know, being mm -hmm. interpretive artists, yeah. do we want do we want to do a conceptual view of the world of this mm -hmm. play, or is it a psychological view of this play? Mm -hmm. Is it literal? Like, where where does that come into? Where does that come into the mix of the design about whether or not it's going to be more conceptual or? No, I think that realistic? that's you know it's interesting. I think it's just a matter of you you sort of figure it out, and if the way to tell that most clearly is a more abstract or conceptual production, but I think every production in a way is conceptual. And the thing is too that. It's all relative to the piece. Um, for, for instance, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, you know, it, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was, was doing La Boheme, hmm. which, we, because there's so much tradition to go with that. And in many ways, the design that we did for that, um, which was done several different places, was in its way shocking. Now, if you were looking for the kind of you know, production where it'd be you know, people in a big yellow room with dirty laundry all over the floor, and like if you think that that's conceptual, 
well, then you wouldn't find that production of OM right. to be conceptual. OM, OM but everything has its degree. You know, like if you're doing certain plays are just by nature more abstract and conceptual. Mm -hmm. So you really have to you know, take that farther. Something like OM, which you have to respect a lot of the expectations and everything else for the piece, it was really, really hard. And yet we, we found a way to do it. So I never think in terms about you know, is it going to be about the level of abstraction necessarily? I think that it's a matter of what's the best way to make the idea happen and what can the play handle? Because certain things can handle more than others, you know? Well, so if I'm thinking of the, I mean, I think was the Glimmer Glass, was, the, was that the first place that you that you did that? Oh, and yeah, 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 started the, in that In that, I, was, I think I was there that summer. With, uh -huh. uh, it was 2000. Yeah, and Were um, you, was that glass blowers? Yeah. Because you were in glass blowers, yeah. right? Yeah, and oh, that was a what was amazing was the third act was set like at a train station. Yeah, yeah. Right, and then and it made so much sense. It was like the you know that this idea of people parting ways. It made so much sense that it was at a some sort of yeah. depot. You know, yeah, and it yeah. just it was such a simple solution to giving the space a, a, a sense of tension about it because you're supposed to say goodbye to people in a place like yeah, this. It's, it's, and it's know? so interesting too because you know I have to realize one of the things I I do and. And I, it's paid off for me, but I don't know if I would recommend this to young, maybe it's a good advice to people that are starting, but I often design for moments. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, they're, I'm so lucky to do a lot of stuff with music. Because when you, you know, I, music in many ways it is much more uh, objective um, than a lot of other things. You know? I mean, Mozart is, is pretty subjective for a lot of the time. But when you get to people like Strauss and Puccini, it, it's not subjective at all. <laughs> you, can't, you can't fight with it, especially Strauss. I mean, all the decisions are made for you in a way. But um, in that, I just had this, we had this idea when we decided about the period that we were setting it and some other things. And, and the third act of Bohème, which I think is one of those rare moments that I would have to say that the third act of Bohème is uh, a, 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 a piece of perfection. It's like the most perfect diamond. There's not a note extra in that piece. It's just as a, at the third act is just remarkable. And um, so when we decided the period and whatever, and which we decided would be right at the beginning of the First World War, um, and, and then somehow that the third act location is always a little bit ambiguous in Bohem. It's like, it's supposed to be like a city gate, yeah. which is where people say, yeah, you know, hello and goodbye. But we just thought that it could be like it's a, a tavern at a train station. You know? um, and I had this, I got really excited about it because I just wanted a moment where there was a huge cold piece of machinery, meaning a locomotive, and I wanted that moment where Mimi's come in, she's clearly, she's had a little scene with Marcello, and then Rodolfo, her former lover, comes in, and he and Marcello, his friend, have a discussion about Mimi and about that she's sick. And I wanted her to have a place on the stage that she would just seem like there was something that was like crushing her. And to me, it was that machinery, that locomotive. And I wanted the place that they could be in the staging and that she was there, like, hiding at the locomotive. Um, and it just sort of increased. I just thought it'll be, it's a heartbreaking moment. I mean, you know, she's there and she's sick, and then you hear um, Rodolfo talking about, I think she's going to die. I'm just worried because she's so sick. And she's hearing that, for the, like, you know, how did, does she know that? I'm not sure she knew that necessarily. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she's overhearing them. And so it was like for that moment, that's, it was like, okay, I want that idea of that train. And wouldn't that be amazing? And then the director, James Robinson, was just like, that is, would be so, it's so perfect. And, and it was. Yeah, I, in that show, it really like, when she's there, it was like, whoa. It, so then normally the, the at the end of that act, normally the, that duet between the two of them is, you know, they are like this together. And I still remember to this day, he staged it that they're opposite, opposite ends. Sides, yeah. Opposite ends of the stage with this big 
a piece of machinery between them, yeah. and the t of the tension. Yeah. I w it was it was incredible. So I, the, the, the sketch of it's down there. Did you see it? No. This, yeah, because no. I get I, I, oh, well, after oh, the okay. show I gave Jim the sketch and he had it framed, and uh, and I said to him, Oh, could I borrow that back? for this show. <laughs> he said, absolutely. So it's on the wall. And then also the model piece of the train oh, is, is in that. There's I a, love that. There's a vitrine that. of like old model pieces for models that I've sort of thrown away over the years but saved pieces of. And if you go downstairs, you'll see it looks, I wanted it to look like I dumped oh, it into the vitrine and I it sort it. of looks like that. It's, it, it um, looks like a John Conklin's apartment. There you go. Know. And you'll see <laughs> the train is there. John Conklin was, a, one of, was my design teacher and Jeff has done shows with him. Yeah. But, uh, but, but th there is, and, and I think about a lot of times that they're for moments. Like I was talking about Lisa Strata Jones, when we were setting up the thing, I was talking to Andy, who was lighting it, and to Rich, who's down there working on setting up the show. And we were talking about the show, and they're like, oh, no, no, no. I said, oh, well, you know, oh, this is, we were listening to Lisa Strata Jones, the, the recording, and we got to a certain point, and we're like, oh, oh, guys, this was the, this was the moment, like that, what I call dream girl's wall that's mm -hmm. across the back. Um, I said, oh, this is why that, like this is the song where that was for. And it was all, that was all, it's a moment in the music, yeah. which was the last song, song of the first act, and there's this amazing key change that I'm like, uh, we need something big. And that's what, you know, a, a curtain opened up, and there's this big thing, and all of a sudden then these lights come, boom, like this at you, and it was, it was a jolt. So I, I do think that, I do believe that designers, especially, you know, I think you, if, you get, if you're working on musical things, you have to be musical. Mm -hmm. And you can tell, I'm sorry, but you can tell when you see an opera or uh, a, a musical, and you can say, wow, that designer is musical. Which is, uh, you know, many of you have probably seen Phantom of the Opera. Which is, you know, whatever you think about the piece, whatever. But that's an amazing set. Well, it's Maria Bjornsson who did sets and costumes. And she is a, 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 that's a great example of musicality in, in designing for the theater. Because that is just, it's the most musical design um, that you could, everything is, supports every note. When does it get decided whether you'll do just the set or the sets and the costumes? How does that happen? Well, you know, I, I don't, well, first of all, I don't like doing costumes for plays because I don't like the process with actors of doing costumes. Uh, I do like the process with singers to do costumes. Because singers are much more open to, uh, they're a, a, a little bit more used to someone, you know, they're a little bit more used to someone helping them with that. And a lot of actors are really controlling about it. And I think to make, to make a, to be a really great costume designer for, uh, for plays, that has to be something that you're committed to. Um, and uh, um, so I like working with singers, and I also find that uh, I'm not interested in doing because I'm you know I'm not going to sit somewhere with a sewing machine. I can't do it. I need to only get myself involved in a situation where it's got an, a great costume shop that can actually do that for me. You know, and with great drapers and great you know. And so places, I've done most of my costume work in, in recent years at Santa Fe Opera, because Santa Fe Opera is one of the greatest, you know, I mean, it's genius, you know. But you did, I mean, back here, working with Lisa Jones, I mean, you, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you, you did have to do it. You did yeah, have to. Yeah, I mean, it was, and, and maybe that's why yeah. I know that it's just not for right. me. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't build sets either. I mean, I can paint them. Right. But um, it's good to know what, what you can do and what you can't do, because you're going to get stuff in a situation where you're totally screwed and you just can't deliver, you know, um, so, so that's the thing. And I, I, I would, I'm not interested in doing costumes without doing the scenery too. Like, I only like when it's, you know, and sometimes I just think. But is that because a director says, but I want you to do both? You're like, sometimes I, I, I will, yeah. That, yeah. But then there are other times, like, I was doing a production of um, Streetcar Named Desire in Dublin at the Gate Theater in I don't know, like late 90s. And because in places like, in Europe, the tradition is that someone designs both scenery and costumes. It's becoming less of the norm, but it's still it's pretty common. And I find, with the exception of Maria Bjornsson, 
who was a, as great of a set designer as a costume designer. I think that all of us have something we're better at of the two. And, uh, and I'm definitely a, better, a more natural and better set designer than I am a costume designer. A, but I think I'm a good costume designer, but not a great costume designer. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, so I was doing, there was Street Card, it was also, it had a kind of starry cast because it was, um, Francis McDormand was playing Blanche. And um, I, and I just thought to myself, you know what, I am not, I can do this, but I'm not, I'm not really good enough to be doing costumes for Frank McDormand. Like, like that's going to be an amazing process for somebody. And so I said to him, listen, I really don't think I'm the person for this job. Sometimes I'll say to myself, if someone says, would you do the costumes too? I'll say, am I the best person for this job or one of the best people for the job? And, and I thought for that instance, I thought, listen, I can name 20 other costume designers that would be so much better than me at it, so what, I'm not going to mess around with it. And so I said to them, I told them that, and they said, who would you recommend? And at that point, I was working a lot with a costume designer that I've done tons of shows with, named Michael Crass. And I'm like, this is a great show for Michael. And Michael did it, and it was, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Um, plus, sometimes you get lonely when you're the set and costume designer, because it's nice to have other, more people around. Collaborators, More people yeah. have dinner with and stuff, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, so, it's uh, uh, so so that's it. I, I'm careful, and even in Santa Fe, there was um, uh, when we did uh, uh, Daughter of the Regiment. I really had little or no interest in doing costumes for that show, but it was a director that basically was like, that basically Charles McKay came to me and said, um, well, "Listen, Alan." the person that the director's asking for is really not somebody that we want to hire. And you did Last Savage with him, it was so successful, and, and I did both sets and costumes, and he said, um, I really ask you to reconsider. Would you, f would you, for me, think about doing the costumes for Daughter of the Regiment? And I said, sure. Because he was right, and I thought, I don't really want to do the scenery for this, if that person, if, if that's the person <laughs> he's gonna get other than, I mean, right. I, you know, I said, well, how, I, I, I said to the director, I said, listen, can I give you some names of other of costume designers for this? And he's like, oh, I'm sure of it. But then he's like, no, this is, the, it was someone that he had worked with before. And he wasn't, she just wasn't, she didn't have the chops for Santa Fe Opera, uh, frankly. And then a couple years later, I was doing another show with him, and I didn't want to do the costumes. And so he did hire her, and they were a mess. <laughs> a mess. <laughs> You know, um, and I thought, well, I, I mean, but I just didn't want to. It's like I didn't want to do it. But he wouldn't. He wouldn't hire someone else. It was somehow this person was someone he was determined to get at Santa Fe Opera. I don't know if he made some pact with her at one point in his life, like whatever I do at Santa Fe Opera. I'm gonna hurt. I don't know what it was, but um, so it's it's a it's a tricky thing. But. Can we talk about sandboxes? Um, the world of opera, the mm. world of plays, you know, um, you, or working in Europe, Broadway, mm. regional theater. Um, what, what, are the, what are the big challenges that you know going in to these different sandboxes? Like how different mm. does, that, does that, I mean, I don't, whether it's scheduling or budgeting or yeah, yeah, infrastructure, yeah. What, you know, what are the kinds of things that well, they're all students, different. You know, students were, were really interested yeah, in knowing yeah. what's it gonna be like you right. know, doing Paradise Square on Broadway? Right versus, you know, Santa Fe or... Yeah, yeah. Well, Broadway's its own thing, you know. Um, and that's it, another, that, you know. Um, many times Broadway's like Lord of the Flies. <laughs> uh, it's not for everybody and uh, certainly not for the faint of heart. Um, you know, when there's that much money, when the stakes are that high, is when, you know, if, if people are predisposed to bad behavior, you're going to get the worst thing. I mean, the most, you always, almost every Broadway show, it's just, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's about navigating the waters when you're doing a Broadway show. Uh, Boris Aronson, the, the famous set designer who was, um, uh, he was Russian, um, had a very so heavy Cabaret accent. and oh, company. Yeah, and right, right. Yeah. And apparently he had this expression about, every show has to have a wickdom, he would say. <laughs> And you don't want to be the victim. <laughs> that's what it's like. It's a little bit like that. And sometimes I, I'll say to people, you know, they're like, "How was your day? How was rehearsal?" I'm like, "Great." No one yelled at me. You know, like you, because it's just it's it's tricky. But let's just put that aside because 
that's another, there's, that's like, uh, that's a situation in extremis, let's put it that way. Um, but uh, I, I think that you, I, I think it's very hard to prepare for learning about all that. I think it's something that you need to be, um, as you are exposed to different things, just be open. And then also sort of figure out like what works for you or what you need to do to make it work. You know, the schedule will be very different. You know, you work some of these big, op like you work at the Met and it, it can be very difficult because the, the deadlines are far out. The, the rehearsal schedule is one thing. You know, the other thing you do at, the, at a place like the Met is you have, um, you have your early, you have tech rehearsals, which in opera really just, no, no one on stage uh, except maybe people, light walkers, um, or as they call them in Holland, lichtlopers. Um, the, you know, and so you're you're there, and you do these texts before the show even started rehearsal. So none of the staging has even happened, and it's hard to take it seriously. But luckily, the first thing I did at the Met, which was with Mark Morris, and it was his first show at the Met too. Um, the lighting designer, Jim Ingalls, said to us before these rehearsals, he said, now listen guys, I know that it's, it's hard to take these seriously because it's like, what's it gonna be? But I'm here to tell you that if you don't take it seriously, you're gonna be, you're gonna be screwed. Because when we, after the stage, after it's all rehearsed and we get back on stage with the cast and the dancers, you're not gonna have the time. You can fine tune it then, but we need to, at the end of this week, have a basic look for everything. That if we, if, if push comes to shove, we have something to turn on. If we don't do that, we may have nothing. And that's something that was important advice. And I know other people who've worked there who've not done that. Um, and um, boy, it's, it's, it's been painful and really rough. Well, just financially alone, right? I mean, the, the amount of, amount of time that when you have performers on stage, you're paying them. Yeah, it's a it, limited amount of time. That's the thing, especially in opera, where you, well, in opera, it's all about two, you've got to be, once the orchestra hits the scene and they're in the pit, mm -hmm. that's, it's all about that because every second is ka-ching, ka-ching, yeah. you know. Uh, and so you can't waste a moment and you've got to get through the piece. And sometimes you've got a, a, a you know, a three hour rehearsal and you've got an opera that's three hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> You know, and yeah. so it's like right. you know you're not going to finish it, right. so you don't have time. Um, it's it's really it's difficult. And when do the when do the does the broadcast stuff get factored into all of that, or is that sep uh, separate? Well, that's a very separate thing. Okay. And um, what at the Met, what they do is they all of a sudden you'll notice microphones start appearing places, which are always to me like someone spilled a can of red paint on the set. Um, and so, so they start appearing, and then they'll start, you know, checking things and stuff. And then, then usually they take it away for the opening night, and then put it back when they're recording. But, well, like fire shut up in, the, in my bones. It just opened at the Met. The opening night was live streamed and whatever. So they the mic stayed. But you know, they've gotten better over these. First of all, the equipment's gotten much smaller. Um, so you barely notice those things. And then they also bring in the cameras and stuff and do trial things. So that live stream, that was like live in, in Times Square. It was, and also right? the big thing was, that was the thing I think we were all mostly proud of was that, um, I think it was Bloomberg Associates paid to have those live things. And the big one was, it was broadcast live at Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem. And there were, they had to turn thousands of people away to that. And it was like a kind of outdoor amphitheater, which, which seated a lot of people. And that was really the thing that was amazing. Um, so, and the show opened the Met season. It did, as after well. being So you had that as well, opening night. And yeah, that was an emotional thing. I, I mean, I remember the invited dress rehearsal for that show was, um, you know, they always play the, opening of the season at the Met, they always play the national anthem. And so when they're rehearsing for the dress rehearsal, the conductor comes out and they play that too to rehearse that, just to remind everybody how you do it, I guess. And so we were there for the invited dress rehearsal, which is a kind of slightly casual affair. I mean, you know, it's attended by, you know, it's like there's 
2,000 of your closest friends. I mean, you know, the Met seats, what, 3,400 people or something, so they'll invite a certain amount of people. Um, but that was so interesting because I remember in the middle of that Star Spangled Banner, uh, I was completely, I, I mean, I, I, I almost, I had to fight not to sob. And it wasn't because of the national anthem in any kind of sense of you know, national pride or whatever. It was just there we were after everything we'd been through. And it was the first time we were, people were in the theater again. And, and, and when I felt that moment, I looked around, and people were sobbing, but out like tears about that. It was, it was a big deal. It was kind of one of those, that's another thing. I love that when you're part of a, like, talk about empathetic experience, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's also like when you're at the Met, and, and people, when, and something always heightened at the Met because there's so many people. Uh -huh. But when you're at the Met, and there's one of those ovations and stuff, and, the, and I love it when the people up in the balcony, you know, I think at the Met, when, when People lay up what they do when they want you know, for a big thing. They take their programs and they rip them up and use it like confetti. And it's coming from all the way up there. And, and uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, I even like listening to the archival recordings from the Met the, you know, on the radio. And you hear some of these things and you hear the people go crazy. People don't do that quite as much as it used to be, I, I find. Like, but Have you ever sat up there? I have, yeah. I mean, you know, back in the, the day, that's yeah. all I could afford, right, you know, right. just standing room. I know. The, but that's yeah. the back of the space, and all the sound would amplify off the back yeah, of the Yeah, it's a good, acoustically, it's, it's very good. Yeah, but you're looking at people, and they look like ants. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. amazing. Um, maybe this is a good, a good transition to um, questions about self-care. I know you said this is, you know, like... Well, yeah, the different generation wants to think of it like, you know, these are yeah. those things that, that certainly we were, yeah. I mean, little, let alone, you know, worrying about personal finance was not part of a training program, you know what right, I mean? Right, right. Let alone self-care, but how, mm -hmm. how do you care for yourself in the, in the midst of these kinds of, what, you know, help, help yeah. our students understand, you know, what it, what it takes? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a hard one to answer because I think that it never occurred to me that that was something I needed to think about. And I, now, maybe it would have been good to have thought about that sometimes. So it's a hard question. Um, uh, I, I think there are times that I'm in, I've been in situations that have been so incredibly difficult and stressful. But like, how do you know ahead of time? You know, it's a stressful, it's a very stressful job. Working in the theater is very stressful. Not just the work. But the fact that it can be—I've been—I've been really lucky in that I, I've never—I've never been without work. I've never really worried about like, am I going to be able to pay the rent? That's not usual for people, especially if you're a performer. Um, so, I—I um, I think if it's if if I I, I I hate to sound like a hard ass, but I do think if there's a if you're a person that does require a lot of self care. It is, you, one should ask yourself whether you're, it's a good feel for you. Um, especially, you know, I have to say, and it's hard, it's hardest for, for performers it's harder than anybody else because A, you're dealing with the economics of it. B, you're dealing with, I, I mean, rejection nonstop. It's, it's all about rejection. And I, I don't know how people strengthen themselves. And that would be a question to ask other professional performers. Because I think that they're the people that I'm sure have actually had active, coherent thought about how do I take care of myself, you know. Um, and I think I, and I'm not the person to speak to that. Well, are you seeing any differences, I, I guess this is another way to think about it, in, in, the, in the scheduling? Are there, are, you know, are, certainly there, there's talk about the, you know, 10 out of 12s and the, yeah. You know, I, mean, I know that's economics. Yeah. It's like you know, you've got you've got so much you can get done in the day. It costs money to be in the yeah, theater. Yeah. If, you know, if you're not selling, if you're not producing, you can sell a ticket. Right. You know, it, it all costs money. So, but is there? Do you see any any shifts yet? I think there was going to be a little bit of a shift in that, but yeah, and that's fine with me because when Jeff, when Jeff talks about ten out of twelve, that means when you're in what's called technical rehearsals in the theater, and it's all defined by Actors Equity, the Actors Union. 
um, they will allow uh, a, a certain amount of things called 10 out of 12, which means in a 12 hour period, usually from noon to midnight, you can rehearse for 10 hours out of that, right? That's what a 10 out of 12 is. Or there's eight out of 10s. They'll say things like, I mean, for a Broadway show, that it's almost unlimited as far as, it, like they'll say, oh, you could have 14 10 out of 12s or something. And they're brutal. They're, they're just brutal. Because also, they're really mostly brutal for the stage hands. Because the stage hands have to work till midnight. And then the next morning, they have a call at 8 a.m. to work from 8 till noon to actually fix, to do notes and things on the physical production. Refocus lights, do this and that, right? So they have to be back at 10 o'clock in the morning. So when people gripe about how much stage hands are paid, I'm like, I don't want to hear. Right. You have no idea. What well, and, the, and then in a place like Broadway, they, they may not live 10 minutes away. They might live an hour. Well, and actually, most of those guys, yeah, they all live out, out of the city, but almost all of them have apartments in the city mm -hmm. because they just couldn't do it otherwise. It's like the people that work at the Met, which is a crazy, crazy schedule. Um, so, uh, so Jeff's talking about that, and that's what they are. And, and my personal belief is that when you have a 10 out of 12, I, I, I mean, 8 out of 10s are fine. 10 out of 12s, there's so much, it's like the last two hours are wasted anyway. Everyone's exhausted. It's like, just forget it. Just don't even bother. I don't know why you do it. So I'm happy to hear about that because I think it's a ridiculous, it's just, it's just not, all I do is I sit there and I think to myself, but after my like eight, 10 out of 12, and I think to myself, I'm thinking of that opera that I just opened before I started this. And, you know, we had, you know, the tech time we had to do that was basically, you know, 10 hours. Mm -hmm. Total. And total. And here we are with eight 10 out of 12s, and we're still working on the finale of the first act. You know? Uh, it's frustrating to so me. So what, what, what do you anticipate the process will be like at the end of this month when you start going into tech for... Well, that's going to be a different situation, actually, because for a lot of reasons. So that actually doesn't apply, because we're doing some very weird schedule where we're doing a, um, work halls in the morning for the crew, and then we're doing five hours in the afternoon with the cast, and then end of tech rehearsals in the theater, then the cast after dinner break is going back to a rehearsal hall for three or four hours. Hmm. It's a, it's a new piece, but it's the third time we're doing it. But there's still some changes happening. Um, and, but that's all has to do with the producer's perception of how the director uses or doesn't use his time effectively on stage. So he's decided that, I don't know if it's about saving money or just not wasting it. So that's a specific case. Uh, you know, and I, I'm one of the only people that actually support the decision because I agree, it's painful to sit there and watch that much time and money being thrown down the drain. It's just not used effectively. So it's like, okay, put a, put a restriction on how much time this, these people have to do the work. And, and maybe it'll give them a kick in the ass, I don't know. Well, but because like in, with something as complicated as that, how often do the actors really need to be there for those transitions that have to do with Well, you know, in this case, they do because it could be dangerous. You know, when you've got a set that things are turning and tracking and things are, it's like the actors do need to be there. But at this point, most of the afternoons are going to be used for run-throughs. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to, they're thinking they'll do anything that's changed in the staging first, and then we do a run-through. So every was, day is going to be that. Was everything designed for the Ethel Barrymore? It was, yeah. The, make, I mean, we started out at Berkeley Rep, right? And that we just did for Berkeley Rep. I mean, I was thinking in terms of other places, but... Berkeley is, that's a great stage, their main stage at Berkeley. It's really deep and beautiful. And I, I knew from the start, we're not gonna, there's no Broadway theater that's as deep as this. So we knew we'd have to adapt. And it's like, okay, you know, you're doing it for the first time. You want to give the show its best shot. So don't add too many limitations on yourself. When we did the, the Chicago tryout with, of a revised book and stuff, um, that was at the Niederlander in Chicago, which is massive. But we thought, listen, let's, we knew we were going to be at the Barrymore, which is a great theater, because um, it's got a small, it's only got like 850 seats. It's really designed for plays, but it has had some musicals, like the band's visit was just in there, 
And that was a wonderful experience to experience it in a more intimate way. So basically, I designed it for the Barrymore, and then we took that plan and like plopped it. Like, how does that work at the at the Nederlander? I mean, we could have fit two of them front to back at the Nederlander because it's so big. But we we did that. So you know, we had a lot of room backstage. Um, well, and you're used to doing that move, you know, because a lot of times with an opera company, it'll be a you know a co-production right. with multiple multiple companies and so it has to fit. I remember yeah. we in our days in Glimmer Glass, you know, it was a beautiful little theater in Cooperstown, New York, but then it would go to, to, to the, the opera, state theater, the state theater yeah. you know, and it had to somehow not look as if it was dwarfed. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in a sense, you, you, you bring that, that history yeah, yeah, with you yeah. of how to, you know, yeah, yeah. Set and yeah. make it work in multiple places. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, Resonances, things that you know, students wanted to know about. We can, we all will. <laughs> I've already talked to people that have that have seen the exhibition a bit, and they're like, I, I, am just inspired. I'm just, I, I'm, I, I can't speak right now. I have to think about this. You know, that the, what inspires you? To, where, where do you find inspiration? Well, you know, this may maybe sounds selfish in a way, but. I find inspiration in the interaction with other people. When I talk about slowing down or not working anymore, it's always that that's the part that I, I have to would have to parse it out. But I think if I had like still did two or three shows a year, um, that'd be enough for me. You know, I just miss the people because mm -hmm. I, I have I, I have extremely long term collaborations with people and um, and that are friendships, um, and I would re just miss some of my wonderful, colorful friends. Um, uh, but I think in the end, it's, um, you know, sometimes I'll do, do something, I'm sitting there in a rehearsal or a, a dress rehearsal or something, and I think that it's, um, I think to myself, how lucky am I? I mean, it's, it's like I'm an audience of one sometimes. and. And it's so gratifying. I mean, I think in a way, without sounding selfish, and, but I think everyone maybe that is creative understands that this is really, in the end, you do it for yourself. <laughs> You're doing it for the pleasure or the gratification that you get out of it. And um, yes, it's wonderful when other people also uh, enjoy it, but it's really about what it does to your career, to you, I think. And so I think that, in a way, it, 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 that's a, it sounds selfish, but it's, I think you have to be happy first. Mm -hmm. with it. Is, there, um, is there a fingerprint, thumbprint, that someone said, oh, that, that's, that's definitely, that's an Alan Moyer set. I found over the years that I'm not good at knowing what that is. There, there'll be people that say that, and, and, but I think that's also, I think that happens with a lot of people, unless, you know, unless you're an artist that only uses red paint or something. I don't know, it's just, I mean, I think, that I've always period. thought that, that, that one of the things that, I, I find my work is really, really versatile, and that it's, hard, that it's maybe a little bit hard to do that. Other people yeah. say, yeah, yeah, you're versatile, but yeah, I can, like, there, there's ways I can tell things. But I find that that's hard for me to, to notice. There'll be people that say, oh, well, of course it's one of your sets. I mean, look, it reminds me of this, or it's a, I'm like, oh, all right, well, sure, fair enough, you know. But I've never thought much about that. I think I, you know, because I think everything's so different mm -hmm. that I've always thought that you should do things differently. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, it, it can, you know, we live in a world where people like to, you know, it's like they like to, it's like they're shopping and they're like, okay, who's going to, who, 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 what designer's going to do this show? It's like, well, I think this is a show that's yellow. All right, well, let's get that designer that does yellow sets. Uh, it's like, oh, no, no, he does only blue sets or something, you know. And people want to be able to put labels on people. It helps that I, I feel like, you know, I wasn't, um, you know, technically, I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm younger than the people that are like in the hippie era or that, that era. But luckily I, was, I benefited peripherally from that, uh, from overlapping slightly, you know. Uh, and it was an era that wasn't about labeling people. It was about, you know, being your own person, doing your own thing, you know, and 
Um, so to me, that's important that things are, that there's a lot of variety and the versatility in things. Like I, I find actually that I have a lot of colleagues and I'll, I'll, I'll look at the people that I admire about it. I'll, I'll look at their work and just think, oh my God, it's like everything is, you know, it's like a big box, it's a different color for every show. I mean, there's no, there's no variety in what they do. Um, how can they do that? First of all, wouldn't that be boring to constantly do it or whatever? And so um, I also think that one of the things I do think that, um, that I can tell is that I think I have a, um, a good sense of uh, moving, moving scenery is something that I think I do, I think I do very well. Um, and I think it's because I've never allowed it to scare me. Mm -hmm. Partly that's because I studied with Oliver Smith, who was a genius, you know, very famous set designer that did so many musicals that we all know and love. Um, and I remember Oliver always used to say to us in class, and he always spoke to, which was amazing, because he was allowed to, he spoke to the classroom, and no one, like, you'd never say anything to Oliver about smoking. Because first of all, it was beautiful to watch him smoke a cigarette. <laughs> um, he, was, he was just an amazing creature. Um, and he was also just this famous, famous person. Um, so uh, he always said, oh, don't, don't let it intimidate you. you know, just start out drawing space all around. Do, do three feet all around the perimeter of the theater. Try not to put stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great. I mean, it's like, and then, you know, I mean, sometimes... I remember going backstage. I did this musical called Great Gardens, and um, when it when we did it off Broadway at Playwrights Horizons, I didn't go backstage very often because I felt so bad for those people that had to run that show because you could barely walk. There was so much stuff in the way. I mean, it was a really complicated show, yeah. so it was like it was like it made sense. But but I just remember. I mean, there were. There were platforms built over stairwells and things that scenery could be stored and stuff. But, you know, people are inventive and whatever. And of course, from the first act to the second act for our first preview, I think it took um, 35 minutes. Oh, no. And, but everyone's like, oh, it's going to get, it'll be fine. And by the second week of previews, the scene shift was taken, the, from act one to act two was like 14 minutes or something. So, you know, it just, it just gets better. But, um, so that is something that I, I that's maybe one, yeah. maybe the way something moves might uh, be a kind of signature. Well, and I, I, would, I would say, too, that the, the, your sense of musicality about, when, you know, when, you know the, the, the pace yeah, yeah. of the rising and how things move in and what the storytelling of right, the movement right. is, yeah. is, 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 you know, choreographed R right, and right. orchestrated in yeah. that sense. So that and, I mean, it matches. And, and that's something that you all come up with together at a certain point, but yeah. I do think you have to start somewhere, and I'm the one making those decisions about what's there. Yeah. So you have to have a, a sense of it, and then almost always when you're all together making those decisions and cueing things, yeah. uh, um, it always gets better than you imagined. You right. know? But you have to at least know what, the, at least it's possible. You, you have to have one solution at least yeah. set, yeah. and then other people, are, as a group, you're gonna make it better. Well, so that that sort of mm -hmm. brings us to the to the sort of final area, which is, you know, in a in a theater, whether it's an opera house or, you know, any any theater, your 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 work is seen as design, you know, artistic design. In down in the Friedman Gallery, it's art, it's it's exquisite, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's what's, you know, for for me, it's just to be able to. Uh, enjoy the meal of yeah. seeing all of these different looks and the, and when you when you go downstairs when you make a make a right the, the, I was talking about this sort of glass box where it's just, it's just filled with other set set pieces and things it's, uh, that it's um, it, it's it's so wonderful what was it like creating the exhibition you know it was really fun I kept being bothered, and I still am to a certain point. Like, before we did this talk, I said to Jeff, I was so happy that you came up with this idea about talking with students to try to get questions. Because I said to Jeff, please don't make this like Alan Moyer, this is your life. <laughs> I mean, it's been, <laughs> the whole thing, I've just been overly concerned with it. That I just, 
about the whole idea of the show as a vanity project. It's re like it, that's, I've really struggled with that. Um, but putting that aside, it's been fun. It's been fun to, first of all, it's a great way to clean up. Because <laughs> I thought, listen, if it's not going to be in this show, I don't really need it anymore. <laughs> so I, if there's a couple things that were good, then I just chuck the rest of it. You know, I'm like, at a certain talks, point, at a certain point, you have to clean that basement. You know, I mean, it was just too much stuff. I mean, it's, it's, and some of these models are. I mean, what was interesting was going back to some of the models. Things like the Mother of Us All model that was made in, well, in 1995 or six. You know, yeah. no, we did that in '98. The, the Don Pasquale was made in '95 or '96, yeah. and then the um, the Mother of Us All was made in '97 or '98. So you know, that's old. It's just pe It's just pe paper and cardboard right. and stuff. Right. But most of them held up pretty well. But you know, there's a lot of repair work, and so it was, it was really hard work. But it's been so gratifying, and it's interesting. But Cole Cole said to me, "What's it like when you see them all? Have you ever seen them all together?" And I'm like, "No." The only th yeah, they've all been in the same basement in their lives. <laughs> I've never, and and so it's interesting. And she said, well, "Have you? What do you? What have you learned about that?" I'm like, "Oh, that's interesting. You know, it's, it, we just finished it. We've been working on like dogs, and we just finished it. I haven't had a chance to even address that, right. but now I will. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'll yeah. I'll look at it and say, oh, this. You know, what do I? What? How do I feel about this? But Would you say a word about your collaborators for that project who've helped you this in these past couple of weeks to put this together? Well, the um, well, there's a. My husband, Paul, who's a lighting designer, was meant to light all the models, because lighting these models, <laughs> lighting models is very, very difficult. It's a little easier now that there's all these LED things, first of all. And, and Paul injured himself and wasn't able to do it. So he said to me, uh, I talked to Andy, his associate, Andy French, who, uh, he said, I talked to Andy, and he said, when do you need me to come down? I'll come do it. So Andy's been here for four or five days, and um, I would certainly have to thank him. And I have to thank uh, Jacob Van Leer, who's been an amazing uh, help. He's sort of also helped sort of remind me that you have to stop messing with the models for a minute <laughs> and hang some of this stuff that we're going to have. <laughs> and a lot of the ideas for how it's arranged were Jacob's in a way. I mean. Uh, the, I, there's a section that's just, when Yop was at my studio looking at work to use for the, including the show, he said to me, oh my God, there's a lot of stuff. I said, oh, oh, this is nothing. And he started opening up flat file drawers. I'm like, these are all filled. He said, this is, I mean, it's almost exhilarating um, yeah. what this is like. He said, maybe we should do an area that's just, just pin stuff to the wall. Like, don't even label it. Just like pin it to start, sort of get a portion of the stuff up there. And, and, and that I never would have thought of myself because I would have been much more rigid about the gallery structure or whatever. Um, and then Rich Howe, who's just an incredible uh, asset to the, to the college as far as I can tell, has been remarkable. And, and I, I said to, to David Tanner the other day, I said that the, the incredible um, skill that Rich has is that um, he somehow, even if he's not in the same room, senses when I'm about ready to lose my cool. <laughs> like there's something's not, it's always like, I always lose my cool when it's something that I disappoint myself. Like, how did you screw that up? How many times you have to measure, you know, and I would just lose my patience. But right before I was really, like the meltdown began, somehow Rick would show up and then like somehow diffuse it all. And that, that's an amazing thing. Because talent. as you go in, the models themselves are sort of against a wall with a hole and then there's been the yes. beautiful matting done and so you can you, you know you can really see the proscenium of the Metropolitan Opera. And you can really light them that way. Yeah. That's the thing yeah. because I mean if you look behind those walls it, it you're like whoa look at that. Yeah I mean the, the artistry that it took just to make each of the mm -hmm. dioramas you know. It's yeah I mean it incredible. it was rough I mean because it could take you know some of the models are lit very simply you know depending on the design and others it's I mean Andy's been custom making lengths of LED tape and soldering and everything else just to get it in there to light it. Because it's hard when you're dealing with something that's, you know, these are all quarter inch models. So that means that one quarter inch represents a foot in reality. So there, uh, now some people work in even in, in, in eighth inch scale, which I think is a little ridiculous, but a lot of times the, a lot of models are half inch scale. I've, I'm not fond of working in half inch because 
I, first of all, they take up so much room. They're so big, you know, and, and I find then that they're not so usable. Mm -hmm. you know? I remember working at Glimmer Glass one year with Paul Steinberg. Now, Paul and I have arguments all the time because he only does half inch, and I almost only do quarter inch. And I remember walking in the office at Glimmer Glass and saying, uh, um, oh, where's, where's Paul's model for whatever he was doing that year? And they said, oh, uh, and they're like, oh, it's down there. It was like under a table, I and mean, there's all this stuff on top of it stored, right? There was a big box that was under the table. And I said, oh, well, where, do you have, didn't you have it out? And they're like, that's too big, we don't have any room for it. And so I thought, well, what's the purpose of doing this? Other than have, they're, you know, they're tools. That's the thing. Sketches for the theater, it's nice that they can be regarded as a work of art, but basically it's a tool. And if you're making it, you're defeating the purpose if you're doing something that's in a box under a table, you know? My models, were, it's sort of like it, when they talk about costume sketches. Someone said early on, I used to like to do really big costume sketches in, in class. I would do these big, it was fun. And finally, the teacher said, you know, here's the, the only thing I, I want to warn you about co big costume sketches is that the people who are making the costume are going to look at it less. And I said, why? They're like, because they don't have the room to put it anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, when there's a, a cutter or a draper working on a big table and they're making patterns, they don't have room to spare for a costume sketch this big. You know, and it, it's, sometimes it's hard also to, to make those, to reduce them. I mean, it's like yeah. someone has to work to make yeah. them smaller so you can have them holding your hand. Right. And, uh, and I thought, and, and, and the, the, the thinking was, well, why do the costume sketch if they're not going to have it on their table? You want, the, you want them, trust me, to have your sketch there. So if it's too big and it turns into just whatever. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's, it's an interesting process for me to think about them as a work of art. Because to me, they're not. They're, and and, and, and I, I have to say already, I've looked at, been looking at these things and thinking, well, look at this. They do have a kind of preciousness to them. In, displayed this way and in the uh -huh. gallery in a way that I never intended them to be. Um, which might be hard to believe because the models are, are slightly precious in that they're, um, you know, the, the time it takes, you know. But one thing that was important to me was to have, like we put a little thing up that, that, that David, we put on the wall, because it was really important to me to make sure that people know that the other people who made a lot of those models like, I, I have made a lot of the models that are in that show, especially the early ones, because early on I didn't have the money to be paying people right. whatever it costs. I mean, model builders are expensive. So, um, I mean, I, I always paint my own models. But it was important for me to list the people who, over the years, the, my, the major people who've built my models and stuff, because I've been so lucky to work with remarkably talented. I mean, I think that partly it's because my expectations are so strong that they, the challenge of that yep. interested really good people. Like, if you weren't really, really good, you didn't, work, they, you didn't want to work for me very much because I was too exacting to the things. So, um, but. And then Rich would have to come in and separate the photo. You know? Well, <laughs> for, oh, no, they weren't here. The bottle builders weren't here. No, but, right, um, right. Uh, but uh, no, and I had long, like many of the models in the show were built by my long time. So lucky I had an assistant named Warren Carp. He still works for me. I mean, he's been working for me for, I mean, solidly for 25 years. We went to NYU together. He was a class behind me. And, um, and he's been amazing. He was amazing. It is amazing. So, the, the model for Carmen, for instance, which is down there, which I always said was one of his crowning achievements, um, uh, it's just phenomenal. When do you, you have a the favorite? Detail. Pardon? Do you have a favorite? I can't separate the show from, the, my problem is I can't separate the show, so um, it, it's, it's hard yeah. to, to, to do that. Um, so, and it was important to me too, because a lot of times, I mean, I know we had a lot of discussion with David and Yap about how the things are labeled or not. Because the idea was to try to keep the light level down in the gallery mm -hmm. so that the models could glow. So, and, and so the part of the thing was like, oh, well, often we just have a gallery guide and we go from one to one. And I said, but the difference is in this is that 
I just feel like without the name of the opera or the play or the dance, that it just doesn't, it's not like just looking at a painting. I yeah. mean, yes, you can just look at the inherent object and whatever beauty or interest it has. But for me, it's all about that it's it, about the design. You know, yeah. Like, that's what is, like, jazz is me, you know. Right. Um, and, so I, and so we ended up, we just labeled it with the name of the opera, the, the piece, and then a date. And then there's a gallery guide to talk more about it and other things. So I thought the director should be credited. Right. With, uh, things like that. So, um, but yeah, it's been a fascinating process and everyone's been terrific. I've really enjoyed myself. And it is, it is nice to see them all together. Well, we're so excited that you agreed to do it. And I'm sure a lot of you can't wait to see the exhibition. It's open, I think, until 5 o'clock today. Is that right, David? Is that right? Yes. I think 3 to 5. 3 yeah. to 5 today. So um, why don't we bring this to a close so we can let people in, enjoy the exhibition, um, which is in the gallery across, across the rotunda and down, down the stairs. And um, on behalf of everybody at Albright, thank you so much. You're for welcome. This. Thank you all for coming and being interested.